Part one, part two, part three, part four. <laughs> Dear Ajahn, if I have 100 Australian dollars and wish to donate it efficiently, in what proportion I can give to the following? To the monastery, Dhammasara Monastery, Buddhist Society, West Australia, China Grove Building Fund. Thank you. So what you should do is, what can you do? Um, take it to casino, <laughs> make it four times. No, the Buddha said, wherever your heart feels the most joy. So it doesn't really matter you know, which one it is, wherever you feel the most joy and happiness then that's the place to actually to give it. Is that a good idea? Yeah, okay. But when you give a donation, as you'll find out on Katina Day, we never called it $100. Because last year, the I forget how much we raised, so, so it's like 10,000 Australian dollars. We never say that. We say today we, ro we raised one million. <laughs> And when I first did that, everybody knew, ah, Sadhu, you raised one million cents. <laughs> <laughs> That's 10,000. So when you write this question next time, say, I have 10,000, and I wish to donate it officially, what <laughs> portion can you give? 10,000 cents. You see, this is like positive thinking, it sounds much better. Doesn't 10,000 sound much better than $100? <laughs> No, I would say ten thousand dollars. There we go. Right? This is okay. Ajahn, you deserve to be respected by us. Yeah. <laughs> I pray that you will always be successful in whatever Dharma projects and there will be people always to support all their Dharma work. I was very lucky this year because this year we had a census report in Australia. So they count all the people in Australia and all the people in the different religions. And I was very, very, very scared. If the number of Buddhists in Australia went down, that'd be it, I'd be sacked. <laughs> <laughs> but fortunately they went up from 2.1 to 2.5 percent. So I got productivity bonus. <laughs> I met my sales targets. <laughs> Indeed, I'm very fortunate to be here listening to all Dhamma talks with the presence of monks and nuns. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. For your kindness, gentleness and thoughts, you are super duper triple infinite monks. Very good. I think, oh, actually this is, oh, this is actually the end of a question. <laughs> now the beginning of the question is, they're talking about somebody else. <laughs> no. no, they're not. Part one. Venerable Ajahn, thank you very much and a big sadhu for giving us the lay people such a wonderful, conclusive and thoughtful heaven like this to meditate. I can feel your unconditional love and care everywhere. Right from our kuti with such wonderful kitchenware and dining table, just like our home. A heater to keep us warm while sleeping. Heater light to prevent cold after bathing. And a switch beside our bed. Ghost to keep us uh, getting up early in the morning. No, that's not ghosts in here. <laughs> An individual cell to avoid disturbance and with supervisors in the toilet. Who will supervise you? Oh, <laughs> someone has found the hidden camera. <laughs> there is no hidden camera <laughs> in the toilet. So that's very good. Yeah, because when we built this retreat centre, I realised that, look, you come here to meditate, and if, you know, especially the women have to queue up for toilets. I've been in so many places seeing you all queuing up for the toilets. And my one talk I gave, I forget where, I saw all the women queuing up for the toilets and the man's toilet was empty. <laughs> so I commandeered the man's toilet. I said, come on girls, you can go in there, I'll stand guard outside. <laughs> and because I stood guard, no man would go in. So that's the compassion turning men's toilets into female toilets for you guys. So, um, yeah, so we made sure everyone gets his own ensuite, comfortable beds, we try, you know, good food from Wisaka, so that way that everybody can be peaceful and happy. You've got nothing to worry about, nothing to complain about, except your own <laughs> problems. 
So that means if meditation isn't working, you can't blame the food, you can't blame the accommodation, you can't blame anything. That's really difficult, isn't it? It means that you have to really work it out for yourself. So it makes life much better when it's comfortable, it's this middle way, it's not excessive. You, know, you don't have room service, you can't just ring a bell and somebody um, actually come and uh, get you whatever you want. You, know, you don't have a menu, as if you, know, you look at the menu and you order this, today I will have eggs benedict with <laughs> <laughs> whatever that means. Oops, there we go again. So it could be better because sometimes when we were designing this we thought we could also have like individual air conditioning, just this thing which came down right over you and you can actually adjust it if you want it hot, you want it cold, you can just adjust it, personal sort of climate control and you could have these meditation cushions which you could press a button, they could inflate if you wanted it to, to go higher and deflate and another button which you can make yourself a cup of coffee if you're feeling thirsty. <laughs> But no, this is really good enough. It's simple but comfortable, which means that many of you, especially when you get old, you don't need to be afraid of coming to this retreat centre. You know, even if you're incontinent or you've got some sickness, you can come here and you know there's a toilet you can always go to. So it makes it much better for everybody. And you do that because it does mean that more people get deep meditation. And that's what we're here for. We're not here to torture you, we're here <coughs> here to give you peace, compassion, stillness and wisdom. And it all comes together. So the place is designed to fit these teachings and the teachings fits the place. Do your emptiness, please advise, if a deceased relation gives you four digit numbers or discloses facts that will give their relations money, does this affect their karma, their rebirth? It certainly affects the karma of the people who receive the digits. <laughs> they get rich. Will this lead to them being reborn as lower beings as they had interfered with and affected the outcome to the relation's favour? No, they didn't interfere. It was your karma to have wonderful relations who after they died could find out the lottery numbers and give it to you. It's all the workings of karma. That people will actually say, what happens if you slip over and break your leg? Should you call a doctor and get the leg fixed up? Or should you just think, oh this is my karma, I've got to endure this. That's stupid if you think, oh this is my karma, I have to enjoy this. Of course you go and, and help and you sort of try and get a doctor and fix it up. So sometimes people think, oh it's my karma to have a husband like that. Oh it's my karma not to be able to meditate. Oh it's my, no don't just moan about it, do something. And if you can do something, wonderful. Karma is not fatalism and just sitting here and having to endure, do something about it. So that's the law of karma. So if they give you four digit numbers, great. It means that your <coughs> relations are actually doing some good karma, they're being generous by giving a donation to you, and you can give the donation to the monastery, so you, could <laughs> <laughs> you make good karma as well. Everyone wins. Thank you for your kindness and compassion in speech and everyday actions. It means so much to me and I'm sure others as well. Sadhu, 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 he, he, he. These are really nice questions, I like these questions. <laughs> we should have like two boxes, complaints and um, compliments. <laughs> and the complaints one I'll just throw in the bin straight away. <laughs> and I'll just keep the compliments. Praise is actually very, very good. Because you've actually praised yourself. Have you praised yourself today? Have you looked in the mirror and say, well done me. <laughs> I'll give you now one of the great teachings of how to praise yourself and be kind. If ever you're feeling depressed, upset or angry, put out your two hands like this. Put out your two hands right in front of you and start bringing them in and give yourself a hug. <laughs> <laughs> it works. <laughs> It's much better than going to a psychologist and paying all that money. <laughs> so try that. My friend joined a very rigorous marathon. Oh, what's this? A very rigorous marathon of overlooking. Oh, over, oh, over 100 kilometres. 
Gee, running 100 kilometres. When I went to school, I went to school in this school in Hammersmith, which was right next to the Thames River. And we used to do these um, marathon runs, you know, try and get the kids fit, you know, just around the towpath to the river, over Hammersmith Bridge to Barnes Railway Bridge and back to the school again. It took about a couple of hours. But the very smart kids, they always took a few sort of bit of money in their shorts and when they got to the road, they took the bus to the bridge. <laughs> <laughs> they took the bus back again. Because <laughs> the teacher was at the bridge checking everybody got there. And they <laughs> took the bus. <laughs> They're really clever kids. So if I was going in a marathon, I'd, I'd take the bus. <laughs> my, <laughs> my friend joined a very rigorous marathon of 100 kilometres. During halfway, she almost collapsed. Yeah, I would too and had to rely on her mindfulness to take things literally one step at a time. Interesting, as she was doing this, she started seeing the, the desert road more colourful and beautiful. That is what she said what, uh, on her mind after the race. What actually happened there? How can she experience such high level awareness when tired? She was probably exhausted, sort of oxygen depleted in her brain <laughs> and hallucinating. That's more likely, actually. If you're doing a marathon like that, it's not sort of all that natural. Why do people actually do such things? Now, sometimes we think that to prove something to ourselves. And after a lot of time of life, you say, oh, it's good to do it for fitness, or just to run. But if you get tired, stop and sit down and have a rest. Or if, you know, you've got 30 miles and 30 kilometres, you feel this is a big mistake, then stop. Why just to try and torture yourself just to prove a point? So that's what I would always do. If I'm doing something and it's obviously wrong, I stop and change my plans. But many of you have got such firm plans. No, I've decided I'm going to do this and I'm going to do it all the way through. And you kill yourself, that's crazy. Okay, here we got the first uh, silly question. Dear Ajahn, why do the Tibetan monks practice tantric sex with the Tibetan nuns? Is that part of their spiritual development or a BS excuse? What does BS mean? Is it Buddhist society? <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't mean Buddhist society because I'm not allowed to say that word bullshit. Oops! <laughs> <laughs> so instead we use Pali. Go, my young. <laughs> so you can impress everybody in Buddhist circles by saying that's a lot of go, my young. <laughs> and that's what it means. Go is bull, and my young is you know, shit. That's a party word for bullshit. <laughs> go, my young. <laughs> and that way you can say it's in a lot of go, my young, and people don't understand what you really mean, except people who know Buddhism, Pali. <laughs> Somebody once asked, the Dalai Lama, because I don't know much about Tibetan Buddhism, but you know, the Dalai Lama, he knows a bit about it. <laughs> <laughs> and when they asked him, he says, you know, to actually do this tantric sex business, he said, you know, what are the qualifications before you can actually do that? And he said, well, it's a very, very high practice. And before you can actually do that properly, you have to be able to eat human feces without any repulsion. And he said, do you know anyone who can do that? He said, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's the real hard fact. I mean, it must be something where you've got no ill will and no lust. That's according to him. For me, it doesn't make any, sex, any sense at all. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, but the trouble is, and this is just a warning to you because Maybe not you, because you, know, you have been around Buddhism and learned real Buddhism for long enough now, but I do remember once giving a talk, I think it was in the uh, Taipei Centre in Lavender Road in Singapore. And just before, uh, after the talk, I was being taken to the airport to fly to London. And Angie told me that uh, there was a, a one girl who really wanted to talk with me about a problem she had. So she was in the back of the car, I was in the front. And she was saying that her master, a Tibetan monk, was saying that to have sex with him was a wonderful gift and she was going to make lots of good karma. 
And she was doing that. And I said, no, that is abuse. That is wrong. You can't do that. That is against the precepts. So it's good that you know those things and tell your friends because otherwise some uh, monks who are not real monks, they can sometimes abuse their position and they can make you believe all sorts of nonsense. And sometimes you can believe too much. That's a problem. It's amazing just how gullible some people can be. And this is not just in the modern world, even the time of the Buddha. I like telling this story at every uh, retreat, just to show that people don't change over the centuries. This is the story behind one of the monks, the, sorry, one of the nuns' rules. It's the eighth Pajitya for the bhikkhunis, which you, know, you two both know. <laughs> The eighth Pajiti, it began because early one morning there was a bhikkhuni in the monastery in Sawati, it was in t well, on the edge of the town. Her job was to empty the stuff from the toilets. In those days they didn't have sewer pipes, so they'd actually collect it in buckets and then put it in the designated spot. But early this morning the bhikkhuni, just to save a bit of time because she's a bit lazy, just threw the bucket of feces over the monastery wall. Now usually it would be no trouble, except that morning <laughs> there was somebody walking on the opposite side of the wall. And this was a man who was dressed up to go to the palace for a meeting with the king to do some business. And I don't know what he was thinking about before, but after he got a bucket of shit on his head, <laughs> he was thinking of something totally different. Now what would happen to you if you were really dressed in your best suit and that happened? Would you just say, oh, let it go. Make <laughs> peace, be kind. No way. <laughs> that guy was infuriated. He was really upset. He knew where it came from. And so he started swearing and saying, those aren't real nuns in that monastery. They're just pretend nuns. Look what they've done to me. I'm going to teach them. And in those days, they didn't have electric street lights. They had these little torches, which would light the way early in the morning. So he grabbed one of those flaming torches and he ran into that monastery to burn the whole thing down. Fortunately, there was a lay person who was just walking out who saw this man with shit all over his head, <laughs> angry, <laughs> trying to burn down the monastery. He said, no, what are you doing? I'm burning this, look what happened to me. These aren't real nuns. He said, hang on a minute. That's amazing. You mean you've been blessed by such holy stuff? <laughs> wow, that's so lucky. I know what happens when people tell you in Singapore that's really lucky, a lucky temple or a lucky, you always go there. And so he thought, what? It's lucky, really? Yeah, really lucky. To get blessed like that from a holy bhikkhuni, wow. He said, look, look, you go back, get changed, have a wash, and then you go back to the palace. I guarantee something good has happened today. Really? Yeah. So he thought, well, no, I've got no time to burn down the monastery now because I'm going to get some good luck. <laughs> I'll do it tomorrow. So he ran back, got changed, got washed, and he went to the palace, and as fortune would happen, he got awarded a really lucrative contract from the government. And so, he, he, he's, you know what it's like in business, if you make something good like that, you go around telling your friends. He went around telling his friends, if you really want good luck in your business, <laughs> it worked for me, just go and ask the nuns for some holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, when, the, <laughs> this is true, you read it, when that made the rounds and the Buddha got to hear of it, he scolded those nuns and said, you were really lucky that time that you had this lay person who, who convinced this stupid gullible businessman that holy shit is lucky. It's not, it's filthy stuff. But don't do that again. And from that day on, for the last 2,500 years, the eighth rule in the Pajitya section for bhikkhunis is you shall not throw a bucket of shit over the monastery wall. <laughs> and that's true. It's there. <laughs> but I mentioned that because it just shows how gullible people are. So be careful there. 
Now use your common sense. Even everything I say, please don't believe it, okay? Yes, Ajahn Brahm, <laughs> we won't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> don't even believe that. In other words, think for yourself, for goodness sake. So that's why that sometimes that tantric sex does, make, tantric sex does not make any sense to me at all. So don't even bother with it. For a moment, the carpets in the room like a sea, looked like a sea of flowers as I was walking on them, but before I knew it, they were gone. Is this it? My imagination, or am I going crazy? <laughs> now that's what happens, that's good mindfulness. That happens to you sometimes. You've got strong mindfulness, your peace, and what you actually see is much more than you've ever seen before. You know, if you've heard, seen some of those stories I wrote about in Mindfulness, Bliss and Beyond, in Singapore, that's Happiness Through Meditation book. They like to change the titles, because the original title of that book was Mindfulness, Bliss and Beyond. But the Buddhist Fellowship decided to call it Happiness Through Meditation, so people already had Mindfulness, Bliss and Beyond would buy the new book as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not, they thought it was a better title, but some people have bought both books. Anyway, in that book I mentioned that in Thailand once I was doing walking meditation in the hall, it was a concrete floor, and I was getting very peaceful, getting really nice meditation, and then I had to stop because the concrete which I was looking at just was incredibly beautiful. And I just couldn't, couldn't walk past it. It was just like a great painting by some master painter. And it was just so beautiful for a long time, and then it sort of closed up and became concrete again. That's what happens when your mindfulness gets strong. You look at the bamboo floor in front of you and you go, wow, how many colours and shades are right there in front of you? And just the way these little lines sort of move together and then go away again. It's incredible what's going on in there. And that's just in a bit of bamboo. You go outside and see a flower on a tree or a bird. Wow! That's one of the things which happens when your mindfulness gets strong. You see so much more and what you see is very, very beautiful. I haven't actually um, told this story because I tell it usually every retreat. Many years ago, I walked up the hill from the bottom of the road to Bodhinyana Monastery. First time I'd done that in seven years. And as I was walking up that hill, Kingsbury Drive, I couldn't recognize my surroundings. When I was walking, it looked totally different than anything I could remember. And I, I'd been up and down that road for about seven years, three or four times a week, in a car, and now it looked different. And that shocked me so much, I stopped and just stood, and just standing there, not moving, the hillside changed again. I could see many more things that I'd missed, and what I saw was just so incredibly beautiful. The colours were more, more rich. And again I wondered, am I going crazy? What's happening? And there was an obvious reason for that. When you look through the window of a speeding car, your eyes don't have time to form a proper image. The light hits the back of the eye, and before it can form a full image, another image comes up, and then another image, and then another image. So number one, you don't see detail. And number two, the colours are washed out. So when I got out of the car and walked, I had more time. So the images of the hill which formed on the back of my eye were more fully formed with more detail, and the colours were richer. But when I actually stopped and stood still, only then could I see all the little blades of grass, the little rocks and moss, and all the other stuff on that hillside, which I'd missed before. And only then did the colours, like the green of the grass, have time to really form in the back of my eye. Because you know, sight is a chemical reaction on your retina. If the light doesn't have enough time, just the reaction doesn't work, or it's only half worked. So you get a like a picture which is only half developed. When you stop and be still, you can see everything. My goodness, it's so beautiful. That's what happens with you. If you live your life as in a fast car, looking through the window, you miss so much of life. And you think you know, but you don't know. And one day, instead of going fast, you come on a retreat and you start going slow. You literally see and hear much more. 
And sometimes you get so still, you see everything. You see things in the floor you've sitting on, been sitting on for a week, which you've never seen before. Oh my goodness, it's so beautiful. This is what happens. With stillness, you get joy and insight. This is what happens, so it's very good. That's one experience that will be repeated many times. You get so still, you look at a brick on the wall, wow, look at that. It's amazing the different colours of, of yellow and white and cream, You're just in one brick on the wall. And you can look upon it for an hour, and it's just so amazing. There's an old, uh, there's an old poem, it was actually from, it was William Blake. To see a world in a grain of sand, a heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand, an eternity in an hour. To see a world in a grain of sand, it's just a grain of sand. But when you're slow and still and peaceful, you can see so much going on in just one grain of sand. To see a heaven in a, a wild flowers are very small ones. See a whole heaven in there. How does that mean? You look at it with stillness and everything opens up. It's amazing what you can see in there. Hold infinity in the palm of your hand, right here. Eternity in an hour. William Blake would have said eternity in a moment, but a moment wouldn't rhyme with flower. So he said hour instead, that's all. When you're meditating, many of you have already gone into this beautiful silent awareness in the present moment. And there you are, just in the moment. When you come out of meditation, you have been perfectly aware, you haven't been sleeping, perfectly aware. Two hours have gone past, how can that be? In eternity, in a moment. You lose all the concept of time. That's what happens when you become still. So the guy who wrote that poem, William Blake, he must have known something about meditation. <coughs> when one reaches enlightenment, and a chitter vanishes, just like a candle fire running out of candle, does it mean it dies permanently? If yes, how can one experience total bliss when reaching enlightenment? That was a question which they asked Venerable Sariputta, the wisest of all monks, apart from the Buddha. And he gave this very profound simile. He said, have you ever been sick? When the sickness vanishes, aren't you happy? Because the happiness for when a sickness vanishes is the happiness of the end of an affliction. And he says that when your body disappears in jhana, you're happy because the affliction of having senses in a body vanishes. In the second jhana, the happiness of the second jhana is the affliction of having a will, having choice, doing things, totally vanishes. When you get totally enlightened, the affliction of having five candors vanishes. That's why you call it happiness. The affliction of samsara, suffering, has gone. That's why Nibbana is the ultimate happiness. To understand that, you have to see things vanish. And understand there's many different meanings of happiness, and this is the ultimate one. Afflictions disappearing. That's a profound question. You get the prize for the most profound question. <coughs> Is it true what they say about the importance of the last thought upon death? I.e. that determines your rebirth. Yeah, that's true, your last thought is important. And the other point is, you never know when you're going to die. It could be this moment. Ah! Oh, damn it, I, di I didn't get a nice thought. <laughs> so the only way you can be sure is always to have good thoughts. Otherwise, you may have good thoughts all day, and just one bad thought, and then you die. <laughs> and then you're stuffed. What's that famous story? Okay, here we go. About the... Uh, this actually was supposed to be from Sri Lanka. About this businessman in Colombo. And he was what we call a Waysak Buddhist. You know what Waysak Buddhists are? You have them in Singapore and Penang? They only go to the temple once a year. That's Waysak. They're called Waysak Buddhists. The rest of the year they just 
you know, go to the casino, they drink, <laughs> whatever they do. But they're Buddhist, they go once a year. So this guy, this businessman, would go to the temple once a year on Waisak. And a lot of times he only did that because his wife wouldn't cook him dinner if he didn't. So he went there one day, there we go again, having to give a donation and say these precepts, he just didn't like going. But he heard the monk give a talk about the last thought is the most important. And if you have a very good last thought, you're bound to go to heaven. And the monk especially said, the best thought you can have, guaranteed you'll go to heaven, if this is your last thought, is thinking about the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. And being a businessman, he started to think about this. He said, if that's all you need to go to heaven, then I don't need to go to the temple anymore. Nor do I have to give donations to all these fat monks. <laughs> and I don't have to keep precepts. All I've got to do, all I've got to do is to make sure my last thought is about the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. And then he said, how can I do that? And then he got this brainwave idea. He's a very clever man. So when he went home, he had three sons. He by legally renamed them the eldest son the Buddha, second son the Dhamma, the third son Sangha. <laughs> Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha. Because he knew, you know, filial piety, your children will be there at your bedside when you're dying. <laughs> so he said, this is okay, I don't need to do anything good anymore. My three kids will be there by my bedside, so I'll always be thinking of Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha. I'm going to go to heaven. And his plan was working perfectly. He got his last illness, he was on his deathbed, and of course, Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, his three sons were there next to him. And he kept on thinking his last thoughts, Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, I'm going to heaven. Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, I'm going to heaven. There's Buddha, there's Dhamma, the Sangha. I'm thinking of them, I'm going to go to heaven. And then a thought suddenly came into his mind. If my three sons are next to my bed, who's looking after my shop? <laughs> and that's when he died. <laughs> so, <laughs> the moral of that story is, is you, can't, you can't beat the system. If you've been thinking bad thoughts all your life, or most of your life, you'll have a bad thought at the end. If you've been thinking good thoughts most of your life, you obviously have a good thought at the end. So it's how you live your life is going to determine what your last thought is. You can't decide, having lived a bad life, to think of a good thought right at the very end. Thank you for making my dream of living in a commune, learning and interacting with like-minded people of growing spiritually come true. Very good. Is that a dream? If it's a dream, you wake up in the morning and it's not there anymore. This retreat is impermanent. It's fading away. Soon it will disappear. Are you ready for that? Thank you so much for this wonderful gift of silence. Best gift I've ever received with Meta. Yeah, I'll give you the bill afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Ajahn Brahm, in your talk you mentioned about a ghost who has the ability to know numbers that will come out. Why has ghosts got such ability? I watched a video recently in which a ghost who claimed to be one of the kings in China, cannot remember which dynasty, he got into one lady's body. He said the lady was his queen before. He mentioned that he is born in one of the lower realms and how much suffering he is, he's got there. I'm not sure about this story, but a lot of things that he said was true. Could you please give some inputs about this? About ghosts getting into people's body here and being able to, because that was your, your, your husband before. Come on you girls, can't you control your husband yet after so many years of marriage? Can't you tell him, get out of here, you know, you can't be in my body. Most times when I've seen people possessed, most times, it, you know, it's no possession, it's just people making it up. It's usually a psychological problems. But I know once I think I saw somebody and it really looked like they, they were possessed. It was very difficult for me because if I sort of basically asked that spirit to go, you know, it was a, a small boy, the boy would die because basically the boy had disappeared and the spirit was possessing the body. It was very difficult to know what to do. The poor spirit was really f terrified. 
But anyway, it's very rare that you get possessed by a ghost. You have to be very weak. And also just um, either sick or a little bit mentally unstable. Once you've been to a retreat like this and keeping precepts and Maidana, you're just too strong. These ghosts can't come near. The classic story I liked, did I tell that story of the lady who was sick in Perth and they got a medium? Okay, I must have told that somewhere else. But there was uh, a Buddhist lady here, she was Thai, and uh, she married a Westerner over here, had some kids, and uh, once she got settled, she invited her old mother over to stay with her in, here in Perth. Because her old mother, had no, old mother had no family in Thailand, and you, know, you have to look after your parents. So she invited her mother over, she came to stay in Perth with this uh, Thai girl. <coughs> and sooner or later, obviously, the, the mother got very sick and was in hospital. And the daughter was trying to find out whether her mother would survive or not. So she went to one of these spirit doctors, these mediums in Perth, and he gave this spirit doctor $20. He gave the name of her mother, the hospital, King Edward Hospital, the ward and the room. And they, that's all the spirit doctor needed. And then the spirit doctor, she went into a trance and she came out maybe 10 or 15 minutes later and the first thing she did once she came out of trance was give the $20 back. And the Thai girl said, no, couldn't you find my mother? How come you're giving me the money back? And the medium said, no, we found your mother. I found the hospital, I went, found the ward, I found the room, but I couldn't get in. She said there was this big power field around your mother, like a force field. I just couldn't penetrate it to find out where, how, your mother, <coughs> how your mother is doing. He said, I've never seen that before. You know, who is your mother? And the tiger, oh, she's a Thai nun. She's been a nun for about 30 years. At which point, the medium snatched back the $20. You should have told me that before. <laughs> people like me can't get close to people like that. And this is actually what happens. You know, spirits, lower beings, can't get close to you. So the only reason you get uh, possessed if you're like a bad person, not keeping precepts, or sometimes really sickly. That's the only real time. So most people who are possessed, you know, usually just, you know, it's not true. There's an old story about this guy, you know, talking about ability to know numbers. He was at home and he had this dream of a spirit. And he heard the spirit say very clearly, like it was like in his ear, go to the casino tonight, you'll have good luck. And of course he thought he was just hearing things, but he said again, go to the casino. He said, no, no, I'm just mad. He heard it very loudly, go to the casino, you'll have good luck. So he thought, got nothing to lose, so he went to the casino, and as soon as he got into the casino, the spirit said, go to the roulette wheel. So he went to the roulette wheel and the spirit said, put ten dollars on number 16. It's only ten bucks. So he put ten dollars on number 16. The croupier put the ball in the wheel, turned it around, bump, 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 the ball landed in number 16. He heard the spirit say, put all the money on number 15. So he put all the winnings on number 15. They turned it around again, and the ball went round and round, and fell into number 15. Put the whole lot on number 27, he heard the spirit say. Put the ball in the roulette wheel, turned it around, and it popped into number 27, and out into the number next to it. And he heard the spirit say, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> the moral of that story is, even spirits make mistakes, <laughs> so don't trust them. They may give you, <laughs> give you a number and it's the wrong one, or it's last week's or next week's and they get the wrong one. That's the tr trouble, so don't trust them. Dear Ajahn, my sister believes her newborn son is our dead mother, come back in a new form. Is this possible if our mother passed away four years ago? 
Uh, how can one tell if this is the case? Similar personality or physical features? Will this be mother-son relationship only prolong their attachment to each other? Thank you. It does prolong the attachment. It can happen. It has happened many times. There was... Oh, remember, many of you know our past president, Dennis Shepard. Some of you have, uh, in Singapore have met Dennis. He's an amazing guy. He was a president. He's an architect. But he, he, he decided to learn some um, hypnotherapy just for a bit of fun. And he's very good at it. And he went to this conference in Sydney. And one of his friends over there, also a hypnotherapist, told the story of this young lady who was suffering from anorexia. She was only about 16 or 17 years of age. And she just wouldn't eat. If she did eat, she'd vomit it out. And you know, she'd been to the doctors and the psychologists and she was getting worse. She was getting close to dying. And so the mother, as a last resort, tried to see whether this hypnotherapist could regress the daughter into a past life and find out what's going on. Because that hypnotherapy, which regresses you to past lives, it actually works. Whether it is a past life or it is not a past life, it works. And many difficulties are solved. Many illnesses, like anorexia, are sort of uh, get much better afterwards. But not everybody can be hypnotised. But this young girl, she was easy to hypnotize and got easily back into a past life. And under hypnosis, she said in her previous life, she was the younger of two sisters. They both fell in love with the same boy. Her sister was pretty, she was plain. And boys being boys chose the more beautiful of the two sisters and got married. And she said she was so heartbroken that she lost the love of her life, she committed suicide. She killed herself and that was her last life. And that explained why in this life she was struggling so hard to be pretty. Because it had caused her such suffering as that she committed suicide in her previous life. The interesting part of that story is as she was relating this under hypnosis, the mother was sobbing hysterically. And when the therapist asked the mother, why are you sobbing? And the mother said, I was that sister. I never told my daughter this. Before she was born, I had a younger sister. She was, she was plain, I was pretty. We both fall in love with the same man. That's my husband, my daughter's father. Now she's got reborn. She couldn't be now my husband's wife. She's my husband's daughter. That's what attraction is. So sometimes that does happen. That was a true story. So it does happen. Sometimes you get attracted back into the same family. If you can't be that guy's wife, you, you become his daughter. To be, be close. So it can be. The only way you'll find out is later on whether they start to remember details. There's many cases where they actually do remember personal details. So it could be the case. Wait and see. I dedicated the merits of my practice to you at 10.45 p.m. last night and again this morning after the chanting in case you were asleep already last night. <laughs> Did you get it? No? Oh well, I suppose my meditation is not that powerful. <laughs> <laughs> Look, if you give a donation, like you're saying $100, which fund should I give it to? If you give it to the monastery, it's actually worth something, or to the nuns' monastery, that actually means a lot, $100. Suppose you said, instead, you sent the $100 to Bill Gates. <laughs> he wouldn't even notice it, would he? $100 when he's got $100 billion? That's like sharing your merits with me. <laughs> I wouldn't even notice it. <laughs> I've answered that question. Now, more about dedication of merits. Can the dead relatives still get it even years after they died, only in a short window after death? It's more easy to get it closer to the death, because they're more connected. The longer you leave it, the harder it is for them to receive it. Just like if you send a letter to someone, they've just moved to New York, they're likely to get it. After a year or two, they've moved on to a new address. You haven't got the new mailing address, and sometimes the letter doesn't reach it. The earlier after death, I well, you know, I'm talking about in the first few weeks, they're more likely to receive it, but if it's a few years afterwards, it's very unlikely. 
I've heard that merit from doing dana can only be received by hungry ghosts. If the relatives has become a deva, they can only receive merit from seed or samadhi practice. This is true. No, they can still receive some merit, but they don't really need it. What they're actually doing, they're very happy that their son or daughter still remembers them, is going to the temple, looking after the family. That gives them a lot of joy when they know that, and that, you can see, creates happiness for them. That gives them merit. What if they were born as a human or animal? How would they be able to resonate at, uh, at you if they've forgotten who you are? Do you really forget who people are? How many times do you meet someone and you think, I've known that person before? How many times do you meet someone and you get so, you don't want to be close to them? Because, you know, something inside of you remembers they've hurt you before. And other times you feel just a connection straight away. A person you've never seen before, you think, and you fall in love with them and get married. It's amazing just what happens. That's called love at first sight. It's not love at first sight, it's here we go again. <laughs> how, can, how far can one go in meditation using force, even nimittas? You can get nimittas by using force, but they're not, <coughs> they're not comfortable ones. They're very uncomfortable. You're just forcing it. But it's, it's not worth it. How can one tell if one is getting deeper in meditation through force and not the right way? You can feel that tension inside of the body, the tightness inside of the body. Can if you tell if your students are getting deeper but through force based on our description of our meditation experience? Yes, I can, but also your body language will tell me whether you're relaxing or whether you're getting more, more tense. There is a simile which people ask me that you know, how can you know you're going in the right direction? in your meditation, on your spiritual practice. Because until you've got jhanas, until you've got a stream winner, you don't really know if you're going in the right direction or not. You know, maybe a follow of Ajahn Brahm, Tibetan practice, which one is the correct one? And how can you know? And so I told this story, a simile, you know, from the time when I was a student. I would like spending my vacations in Scotland, because it was very peaceful. I'd take a tent, and uh, some vegetables, and has this scotch, but this, this dried uh, barley and peas and beans, which were very easy to carry, and go up into the mountains, get some water, boil it all up, and that was my lunch and dinner and everything. So I could spend some time in solitude. I love those mountains in summer. And I remember once going, I was staying at a hostel one night, and going with a warden, who was a local man who knew the area backwards, we just got, decided to go up a mountain one evening, one afternoon, sorry, after lunch. So we got to the top of the mountain, it's a beautiful sunny day, and there's another mountain close by, I said, let's go to the other mountain. He said, no, I've had enough, I'm going back to the hospital, hostel, you go by yourself. Now normally in that part of the world you should never go by yourself, because it's dangerous. But even the, host, the warden of the hostel said, go ahead. So I went up to that second mountain, I realised why you should never go by yourself because the clouds came down so quickly and I got covered in mist and I couldn't find which way to go. And I thought, like you do, if you're in mist, you think you know the way to go. You think you have a sense of direction. You don't. Because I thought I'd retrace my steps to go down the mountain. But as I was walking, covered in mist, you couldn't see the hand in front of you. I was stepping and I was very lucky because right in front of me, about this far ahead, to the edge of the, the, the uh, mat here, was a vertical cliff, about 100, 200 meters down. One more step and I'd have been dead. Later on, I looked at the maps, and I worked out that I'd gone in 180 degrees the opposite direction I thought I was going in. And that really scared me. How can I find my way out of this wilderness, you know, in the mist? Fortunately, I was intelligent enough to realize, because I'd done some physics, find a stream, because the streams always go downhill. And that's what I needed to do, to find a way down. I've never seen water going up. <laughs> so it goes downhill. So find a stream, and then you'll find your way going down, 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 down. And you go down far enough, and you go under the mist. And so that's what I did, I found a little stream, whichever way it went, I'm going to follow that. And sooner or later, sooner, quite soon, I came under the clouds and I could actually get my directions. And I use that as a simile for people 
who are meditating or having a spiritual path. You're in a mist, nerve the hindrances, you can't really know which way you're going. But follow <laughs> peace, kindness, gentleness, that always leads to Nibbana. Force does not lead to Nibbana. Peace, stillness, kindness, let it go. You follow that. You follow it down, 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 you're going in the right direction. You're being more peaceful, more kind, more gentle. You must be going in the right direction until you get underneath the cloud. That's called stream winning. Once you get underneath the cloud, you can see where you are. You can see how to get to Nibbana. But before you become a stream winner, when you're in the mist, you have to find a stream and follow it because you know it goes in the correct direction. Peace, kindness, gentleness, that you know goes in the right direction. Follow that. When you get under the cloud, become a stream winner and find your way. So that makes so much sense to people. So that's what you should do. Whatever makes you more peaceful. If you get more tense, that's not going in the direction you want. So don't follow that path. More afraid, more control, that can't be the right direction. And then you know how to go. Ajahn, do nimitas, jhanas exist in our perception just like our body and things around us? They exist but they don't really exist, right? Just like the cup. Exactly, but you're using perception to go in the right direction. In other words, uh, you know, you can go up and go down, what's good about going up, what's good about going down? If you use the perception of peace, kindness and gentleness, it does lead in the correct direction. So it does lead to nimitas and jhanas which leads to seeing things as they truly are. Everything is just a perception. There's a famous quote in quantum physics that Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr Albert Einstein was the old scientist, Niels Bohr was the new one. They were discussing, having all these arguments about quantum physics. And the Copenhagen uh, interpretation of quantum physics say, a thing only exists if you observe it. If you're not observing, you're not perceiving it, it doesn't exist. And Albert Einstein said, you mean the moon doesn't exist when I don't look at it? And Niels Bohr said, Prove to me it does exist when you're not looking at it. And you can't do that. And that was his answer, very profound answer. Prove to me the moon exists when you're not observing it. And you can't do that. So, perception is paramount. Where I watch my breath is usually not focused on one place. Sometimes it's at the nostrils, sometimes it's at the abdomen, sometimes at the chest area. Am I out of focus doing Anapanasati wrongly since focusing on watching one of the nostrils may lead to samadhi headache? I try to watch the breath at the chest area as watching the breath of the abdomen may confuse with Upasana. Thank you, Ajahn. Just watch the breath wherever it happens to be. This is not nose meditation, it's not belly meditation. If you watch at the tip of the nose and you get hay fever, you won't be able to meditate. If this time of the evening you watch the breath at the belly, it's so close to the stomach you start thinking about food and get hungry again. <laughs> so just notice the breath wherever it happens to be. Did I tell that story? Because I was a retreat earlier with some Indonesians about the man who was putting one finger on the nostril and then the other finger. I told that, did I? Yes. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. If you I don't remember that, it's the teacher said, what are you doing that for? Well, you told me. Breathing in, one nose. Breathing out, one <laughs> nose. That's Vipassana. <laughs> nose, K-N-O-W-S, not N-O-S-E. So you just, wherever you can watch the breath. So people who have never meditated before, I tell them just to close your eyes, count three breaths, in, out, in, out, in, out, and then open your eyes. And then I ask them, how did you know you were breathing in? However you knew you were breathing in, that's how you watch the breath. And I say, okay, close your eyes and watch 3,000 breaths. <laughs> <laughs> One breath at a time is enough. Dear Ajahn, I was not disturbed by noises in the first few days, but these two days some noise, especially those nearby noise, almost tear me off. I told myself, it's okay, let it go, start from scratch, but the mind starts to be dull. Elsa is feared to be disturbed again at the most unexpected time. Well, just move somewhere else. 
Don't sit next to those noisy people. That's one thing you can do instead of complain. Do something about it. Or next time you meditate, get your two fingers <laughs> and meditate like this. Breathing in, breathing in. <laughs> now somebody asked me, it's a good question because when they go home, they live in a noisy place. So how can we meditate in a noisy place? And my last birthday here, which, no, not the last one, the 60th birthday, which some of the BF came for, somebody had a very bright idea of giving me these noise equalizing headphones. So I could wear them on aircraft. And they really work. You're sitting on the aircraft, you can hear some noise, but it's like they're far away. And that was the first time I could actually meditate on an aircraft. I was going to Sydney or somewhere on Qantas, and I put them on, I could meditate at last. But you know what happened? I fell asleep. Because <laughs> 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 I was really tired. But that showed me it really did work. I was unexpected, I didn't think I could meditate. And you put them on, it's so quiet, you fell asleep. And I don't usually sleep on aircraft. So it actually works. So if you are in a noisy place, try noise equalizing headphones. Or well, the next time you come here, <laughs> try those. It, noise goes away. But most of the time it's because you're not enjoying the silence. You know, you're trying a bit too hard, you're not really sort of uh, calm down. And that's when you hear the noise. So if that happens, you've got to calm yourself out. Go for a walk, have a cup of tea, have a rest. Or even you can meditate in your room. That's very quiet. Or go to Bodhinyana Monastery. There's so many places you can meditate here. Dear Ajahn, Ajahn Chah taught us to let go of love and hate and let things be. We also heard of teachings that said we must record all our good deeds and <coughs> to be read to us when we are too weak to read ourselves, to reignite our good deeds, to help us to have a good rebirth. Personally, I do not record dates and events that I participated in, just rejoice in the occasion, that's all. Is Anatta right? Thank you, Ajahn. It really depends on a person. Now, if the person has never meditated before, then you know, just tell them of all the good deeds they've done. Maybe you can even make up a few they didn't do, just to cheer them up. Maybe you thought they did do it. I don't know, but at least you can actually cheer them up, give them positive energy when they're dying or when they're very sick. So yeah, you do let go of love and hate. If you're more advanced than that, you let go of everything. So if you're very advanced, you, know, you don't sort of need to remember Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha when you die. Just you know, remember things like Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta. There's nobody in here. You've died so many times before, just here you do go again. This time get it right. Don't mess around. You know, the body doesn't belong to you. You've practiced that before. And especially if you've done jhanas before, you've watched the body vanish, the five senses disappear. You've let it go before, now do it again. Let it go. It doesn't belong to me. It's not my business. It's not mine. And even your will. It's not mine. It's nothing to do with me. So stop trying to control this process called death. Just you know, sit back and just let it happen. And even this consciousness, mine, there's nobody in here. You've got nothing to lose. You never owned anything to begin with, so just let everything stop. So it really depends on just what you've been doing in your life. And so we give, you know, um, we give messages accordingly to how a person is. So there's different ways you can uh, talk to someone when they're dying. It's the same if someone's you know, a Christian, been a Christian, you don't go and try and convert them when they're dying. You don't go and talk to them about Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha when they're dying. That just makes <laughs> talk about you know, loving Jesus and compassion and kindness. That'll work. Could you please talk a little more about emptiness, ways and means to perceive it, how emptiness can be a way into understanding anatta? Because emptiness, you know, you can, it's very easy on a retreat like this to contemplate emptiness. Just think of your stomach now. <laughs> My stomach is empty. Oh, I want it to be full. <laughs> now, there's many ways, and maybe I'll talk about that tomorrow in the morning talk, because I wanted to continue on inside, especially anatta. Will Jhana Grove organize longer retreats, like 20 days or 30 days? No longer retreats, they're organized in Bodhinyana. But to get on one of those longer retreats, you have to shave your hair and wear brown robes. <laughs> and that's the long retreats. 
You're all welcome. <laughs> Dear Ajahn, please chant metta meditation for us. I've done that. This is what should be done. <laughs> is that what you meant? And I think what you probably mean is do a metta meditation. You should do that tomorrow. Many Buddhists consult fortune tellers. Does that contradict the Dhamma? Of course it does. You're stupid. Look, if a fortune teller could really tell the future, wouldn't they be rich? Why would they be working? I went to Hong Kong last year and they showed me this street where all these fortune tellers were. And they were just wearing ordinary clothes in little stores. If they were really good fortune tellers, they'd be in this big suite in a condominium, you know, wearing really fine clothes. If they can't tell their own fortune, how the hell can they tell yours? <laughs> Never trust a poor fortune teller. <laughs> but we always want to find a fortune, don't we? Remember that story in Open the Door of Your Heart when somebody asked Ajahn Chah to tell the fortune? And what did Ajahn Chah say? Your fortune, Claire, is uncertain. <laughs> so I can tell the future. I can tell the future. The future is uncertain, yes. I know the weather tomorrow. You know what the weather is? Changeable. No, changeable. <laughs> Not cold. <laughs> So I can make a lot of money as a weather forecaster. <laughs> Actually, this other story I just read earlier, it's a very funny story, about there was this monastery in the north of India. I've got time yet. And they just had a new monk appointed to be the abbot. And, you know, in the north of India, up in the mountains, when it's cold, it really is cold. This is just Mickey Mouse cold here. <laughs> And so the monks asked their new abbot, who's supposed to be a good meditator, in your meditation, have you seen what the weather's going to be like this winter time? Should we prepare? And the abbot, you know, his meditation was okay, but not that good. So to be on the safe side, he said, I think the weather's going to be very cold this winter. We should collect a lot of firewood. So the monks went out collecting firewood, lots of it. And then he thought, what if I made a mistake? So, when the monks weren't uh, around, he picked up a telephone and he rang the local meteorological office. <laughs> and he knew there was a guy who worked at that office who studied at Oxford University. He was a professor of meteorology, highly qualified. So he made the anonymous phone call. He said, um, excuse me, what's the weather going to be like this winter up in the mountains? And the professor said, the signs are it's going to be very cold. Thank you, sir. So the next morning he told the monks, yes, it's very clear to me it's going to be <laughs> very cold this <laughs> winter. So you better collect some more firewood. So all the monks collected more firewood. And in a week's time he decided just to check it out. So he rang anonymously the professor of meteorology again. And he said, now listen, are you sure it's going to be very cold? And then the meteorology professor said, actually the signs are showing it's much worse than I said last time. The signs are it's going to be a very, very cold winter. So the abbot told the monks, collect more fire. Collect as much as you can. It's going to be very cold. And then a week later he thought maybe, you know, he's uh, overstepped the mark and become you know, too, too afraid. So he rang up the meteorology professor again. He said, are you really sure it's going to be a very cold winter? And the professor said, absolutely. As a week went past, the signs are showing me it's going to be the, one of the coldest winters ever. How do you know, said the anonymous caller, you know, the abbot. He said, because all the monks in the local <laughs> temple are collecting <laughs> lots of firewood. <laughs> And the one who's told me that story, so that's a simile, that's a metaphor, how the stock market works. <laughs> 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 it's very true. 
What was the question? Okay. So don't consult fortune tellers. In the sutta, some of the Buddha's disciples achieved enlightenment just by listening to the Dharma. Is it possible in this modern world to become enlightened just by listening to the Dharma? How long have I been teaching the Dharma? Have you become enlightened yet? <laughs> <laughs> so it's impossible. Now in the suttas, they just give a snapshot of the last thing needed to become enlightened. In the same way, you may have a photo in your house of when you, became, when you graduated from university. In that snapshot, that photo of the last ceremony to become a BA or an MA or something, you see yourself wearing funny clothes, <laughs> which you never wear any other time of the, your life, and being given this scroll of paper you know, by some dignitary. So if that's all you knew about getting a degree, all you'd have to do is turn up to some university wearing a strange costume like a penguin and, or like Batman and somebody will give you a scroll of paper, that's all you need to get a degree. Because no one ever takes a photograph of you doing your studies, you being at lectures, you doing assignments or you doing your exams. They just give the photograph of the last event. And that's the term in Sasutas, it's the last event which made a person enlightened. All the work they did before, keeping their precepts, being kind, being generous, meditating, you don't do that. So all those people who became enlightened just by hearing the Dhamma, they had been meditating, keeping precepts, being kind for a long time. This was the last piece of the jigsaw and that's what is recorded. Just like the last event at university when you receive your degree, that's the only thing you take a photograph of. So you just can't just become enlightened just by listening to a Dharma talk. You can't become in, uh, get a PhD just by turning up at a university when they're giving them out. <laughs> it's all the other stuff is implied. Dear Ajahn Hahayana, Praise be to your ingenious sense of humour. I've never laughed so much as in your retreats. Even the old jokes have a long shelf life and do wonders to raise levels of energy during happiness. It's simply not possible to feel down. Does comic wit come as a byproduct of the path? I want some. Much meta. So Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> no, I did not write that. <laughs> but whoever wrote that was obviously very wise. <laughs> Yeah, of course, the more you let go, the more light-hearted you are. Sometimes it's really interesting, why do people laugh and some people just sit there, miserable? <laughs> and they feel so superior. I'm not going to laugh at this joke. <laughs> I'm going to be much higher than this. A lot of times it's because of ego, they don't want to laugh. They've still got a sense of self. People who just relax and let go, they can have a good time. Dear Ajahn, my elderly mother, who is a Buddhist, wants to have a burial instead of cremation when she dies. She has asked me to inform my family of her preference when the time comes. Being Buddhist, my family is likely to want to arrange a cremation. It is deemed to be cleaner, and in land scarce Singapore, the burial plot is allocated a limited number of years, only 30 years. Must we follow her wishes? I would appreciate your advice and guidance, please. She wants to be buried. So bury her in the crematorium. <laughs> No, in the oven. <laughs> I buried you, man. <laughs> and then it's burnt afterwards. Now, if that's the case, somebody asked me this in an interview earlier, if that's the case, your mother's wish is important, you should tell the rest of the family what your mother's wish is and let the family decide. And just because it's your mother's wish, it doesn't mean you must always follow it. Because what you do is you balance your mother's wish, like you know those scales? Put them in one pan of the scales and the family's wish in the other pan of the scales. Obviously a mother's wish is really important, that's very heavy, but it doesn't mean it can't be outweighed by other considerations. So I told this person, there was one uh, disciple, that's <coughs> a wife who lost her husband, and the husband said he wanted to be buried in space. He said, I, I can't afford this, how can I do this? But I've got to respect my father, my <laughs> my husband's last wishes. 
And they said, look, that's a stupid last wish, it can't be done, so you know, you've got my permission to disregard it. Bury him or cremate him in the usual manner. So she had to do that, because how can you bury somebody in space? Just, so just because it's the last wish doesn't mean you have to do it. You try if you possibly can, but if it doesn't make sense, then don't do it. So, you can be cremated. Remember just, sometimes, I don't know why people want to be buried, you know, because they think they're cremating, they're going to feel the flames, you know, when they're being cremated. You don't feel anything when you're dead. If you did feel the flames when you were dying, you'd also feel the worms and the beetles burrowing in your ears <laughs> and eating out your brains. So, you know, to me, just cremation is much better than sort of being buried. Do you want to end up like that? All the worms and going inside of you. <laughs> so sometimes out of compassion for your mum. And if you have done the wrong thing, your mother will come and tell you. <laughs> as a ghost. And I guarantee she won't. She'll probably say, oh, thank you, darling. I made a mistake. I never realised you don't feel anything when you're cremated, so please disregard what I said. A word of encouragement from the old birds, meaning those who have attended the retreat for a few years, to the new birds, meaning those who are attending the retreat for the first time. If you are suffering from the aches and pains from meditation and sometimes feel that you are getting nowhere, please know that some of us sometimes suffer from that too. Ha ha ha. In other words, you don't get anywhere. Let's all continue with the path of letting go and may we all be well and happy. It will happen. It is our destiny. You make your destiny. Yeah, you get a few aches and pains, but you get a lot of laughter, you've got a lot of wisdom, it's worth it. How many aches and pains do you get by going to work or doing the housework? You get people who go on these, like playing soccer or, or rugby, they get heaps of aches and pains. But they might know it's fun. So it's part of the course, part of the course of having a few aches and pains but as long as you don't have heartache and mindache. So the mind is nice and peaceful, even though the body can ache. Someone I know smells something foul when they meditate, even at Jhana Grove. Is it a ghost? No, it's the baked beans. <laughs> something foul, something good. Because, I mean, the, the worm in a pile of dung, he thinks that's fragrant. He thinks that foul. Now, which is, what, which is it? You know, sometimes, you know, dogs, they have to roll in the, the poo and they become very attractive to the female once they've rolled in the poo a little bit. So people are really weird. <laughs> <laughs> So one person's foul smell is another person's fragrance. You know, here in Western Australia, there is one flower which pollinates by attracting flies, not, not, um, not bees. I've only seen it once, when I first came here to Western Australia. And in our city centre, you know, in Nolamara, there, when I went in after you know, coming from the monastery, there was a smell of dog poo. And I thought that, you know, I'd, I'd, tr I'd trod in some dog shit. So I looked at my shoes, I looked at everybody else's shoes, you take them off before you come into the temple. You know why you take shoes off before you come into a Buddhist temple? You know why? Because if someone tells a really bad joke, you've got nothing to throw at them. <laughs> like they did to Mr. Bush. <laughs> That's all super you know, the other superstition, rich people have. You see these in Penang and in Singapore. Why is it that you see these people in Singapore getting incense <laughs> and shaking it like that? Have you, do you, have you ever done that when you go in the Mahayana temple? What do you do that for? <laughs> have you ever seen me do that? <laughs> I'll tell you where that comes from. You all know there was a tradition you're first taken to the temple when you're a small girl or a small boy by your grandma. And you see your grandma do that and you follow that. 
You see, the grandma did that, that's how I must do it. But the reason the grandma shakes like this is because she's got Parkinson's disease. <laughs> and you think that's the way that you should do it. And from that time on, even young people that go to the temple <laughs> behaving like a mother or father is only doing that because they can't do anything else. <laughs> that's, where, that's where traditions come from. Actually, what was the question? I forget what the question was. Right. So, <laughs> so, so anyway, be careful of traditions and find out. You know the other thing which I always wondered, because I've been to many of the old temples, old temples, the floors are always highly polished. And I wondered why that was, because the monks don't waste their time polishing the floors all day. And when I first started teaching meditation, I found out why. Because when you meditate, you're sitting down there and you're moving this way now. <laughs> and every time you wiggle, you polish the floor with your fat bottoms. <laughs> and after a hundred years, <laughs> even the roughest wood becomes highly polished. <laughs> so now you know where many of these customs have come from. 